You know, I've always liked Bob Hoover and his advice about flying the airplane as far into the crash as possible. And, uh, you know, somewhere in the back of my mind, I think that I, I heeded that advice. Hello, and thank you for joining us on Aviation News Talk for a Newsmakers Edition, where we talk to people who are making the news. Now, this is not the way you want to make the news, because this week we're talking with a survivor of a rare but often deadly type of aircraft accident that could happen to anyone. But it's also an accident type that's almost 100% preventable through proper checks before takeoff. This accident happened just a month ago at the Reed Hillview Airport in San Jose, California. And in a moment, we'll be sitting down with Glenn Falcon, who will share his experience and talk about how he survived this accident. So fasten your seatbelts, because this Newsmaker Edition starts now. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about everything related to general aviation. I'm Max Prescott, and if you're new to the show, you'll want to check out last week's episode on how to fly a stabilized approach and the price that some people have paid for flying unstable approaches. Now, there are many elements to flying a stabilized approach, and it's not as simple as it sounds, so please listen to last week's show. And you'll definitely want to tune in on Labor Day for the m and Joke Hour. I'm M, and of course, R is the inimitable Rob Mark, friend of the show and senior editor of Flying Magazine. Should be a good time, so please check out that show on Labor Day. Now let's get started by letting me tell you a little bit about Glenn Falcon. He attended the San Jose State University and graduated with a degree in aviation operations. While attending college, he was president of SJSU's Flying Twenties Flight Club and was a flight instructor for the club for many years. Later, he attended the Golden Gate University School of Law, and he has been a California attorney in private practice for over 40 years. As an attorney, he's handled a variety of aviation legal matters, ranging from major aircraft disaster litigation, light plane crashes, ownership disputes, and FAA enforcement actions. Glenn was first licensed as a pilot 50 years ago, and in recognition of that, the FAA recently presented him with its Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award. He began teaching aviation courses at Foothill College in 1970, and for the past 40 years, Glenn has been on the faculty at San Jose State University teaching college-level courses in their aviation programs. He's also a former director of San Jose State's aviation program. In his spare time, he likes to play golf and fly his airplane, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Well, Glenn, I'd like to officially welcome you to the Aviation News Talk podcast. We're excited to have you here. It's always good to be around and talking with you. <laughs> well, uh, we certainly have enjoyed uh, talking many times in the past, but let's talk a little bit about you and how you first got interested in flying and went about getting your pilot certificate. Well, I think as a kid, I had every model airplane that Ravel ever made, and uh we were always around airplanes. I kind of grew up at Wallops Island. It was called Chincoteague at the time, uh, where they were doing Regalus missile testing. And then uh, before that, uh, out at Edwards Air Force Base, I always thought that uh, sonic booms were just a natural uh, thing to have in the, going on around you. Uh, it was exciting times. Wow. So, uh, that that kind of sparked the aviation bug. But, you know, I didn't think about aviation when I got to college. I signed up as a physics major. I wanted to work with nuclear physics. And I'm telling my roommate all about that first day of registration. And I, and then after I bored him for about 15 minutes, I asked him, um, what's his major? And he said, aviation. I go, aviation? Well, what, what are you going to do with that? He said, I'm going to be an airline pilot. I go, they have a major for that? And he said, yeah. So I followed him around, forgot to change my major, became to all the aviation courses, and eventually got a degree in aviation operations from San Jose State. That's great. And uh, I suppose that you decided the nuclear industry was just not the place to be? I, you know, it sounds terrible, but the clinching line of my roommate was about his aviation major. He goes, yeah, and it, Beat spending four years in the library. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That's great. Yeah, there's no question. Much more fun to hang out at the airport and uh, be in uh, flying aircraft. So okay. what, what made you think to become a flight instructor? Well, you know, it was a natural progression in those days. 
we're talking about the mid sixties and, uh, airlines still like to have their uh, flight engineers. So we, at San Jose State, they had a program for getting your AMP mechanics uh, certificate, and and so a lot of a lot of the people that wanted to become airline pilots went through as uh, starting out as flight engineers using their AMP experience. I have a hard time identifying a wrench from a screwdriver, so I decided I'd stay on the operations side of it. So the next thing I knew, I was I took a cross country down to Louisiana out of Radio View and up to Tennessee and back. And the next thing I knew, I had a lot of hours. And the instructor who was on the faculty at San Jose State said, why don't you get your instructor's license? And I said, you mean I could actually do that? He said, yeah. So uh, next thing I knew, I became a flight instructor. That's great. Well, I'm sure you had a lot of fun with that over the years. Do you still teach? Uh, I still teach. do mostly uh, biannuals and some uh, IFR uh, competency checks and stuff like that. But uh, I'm a little too big to fit into those 150s and 152s anymore. So, <laughs> yeah, and that's what most of, most of our students can afford. Yeah. And, uh, so. <laughs> and, and I've noticed over the years that those aircraft have been shrinking. I don't know what happened, but they were a lot bigger when I was getting my license. Well, you know, when I went through the uh, application for the Wright Brothers Master Pilot Award, I looked back, and uh, they presented me with all of my original documentation, including you know the original medical application, what have you. And I think it had me down as 170 pounds. And I'm trying to get back there, and I only have about 50 to go. Cool. So. Very good. Well, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about your uh, recent incident that occurred at Reed Hill View Airport. Tell us, uh, first of all, you know, what kind of aircraft you owned and how long you had it and, you know, what kind of maintenance had been done on the aircraft? Well, I can bore you quite a bit about that airplane. Uh, we got it about 10 years ago and it was in fairly good shape. It had really outdated radios and stuff like that. So over the last 10 years, we've constantly improved the airplane, both the uh, the appearance, the engine, the prop, and all of that stuff. Uh, and I had a, an affinity for Piper Eros. This is a 180 horsepower version, 1968. Because uh, for a short period of time, I actually instructed back at Lockhaven for the Piper factory. And they had us flying in Piper Eros. So I, I've always kind of liked those and had a kind of a loyalty to Piper. So when we had the opportunity to get a Piper 10 years ago, uh, that was our choice. So it, recently, uh, it had a brand new engine, the brand new scimitar prop, all new avionics, and, and some really s sweet avionics. Uh, brand new paint job out of Salinas, and new leather interior upholstery. As a matter of fact, it was to the point where I. I actually didn't want to fly it because I didn't want to disturb anything. <laughs> I'd get a bug on the paint job or a nick on the prop or anything like that. So, But what happened is uh, about a year ago, I had a, a heart attack and went through the process of getting a special issuance and finally got my uh, medical back. And I had an agreement with my wife, and that was that she would learn to fly in case anything happened. And she'd learn to fly in that. Piper, our Piper Arrow. So we put on the insurance and uh, and uh, and all of that. But the plane was missing one thing that would make me feel a little bit more comfortable, and that was it didn't have tow brakes on the co-pilot side. So we had taken it up to Reed Hillview to have tow brakes installed, among some other things. And that kind of... Uh, was the thought process that led up to the accident. Also, had been at the avionics shop, and I have to tell you, Garmin came out with this product called the G5, and it uh, is an attitude indicator, but really it's a glass panel. And we had put one of those in on the pilot side, and I liked it so much that it was also up there to get one on the co-pilot side. Mm -hmm. And we also got this uh, system that Garmin puts out, I think you call it Intelligent Voice, where you can control your radio and have it speak back to you about just about everything uh, by uh, speech commands. So anyway, it was up there for both the uh, G5 and the voice commands and to get the rudder pedals installed. And that's basically how it 
came to be at Reed Hillview. Yeah, we talked about the G5 in a recent episode. That's a fantastic little uh, instrument. So on the day of the accident, I guess you were up there doing some testing. Tell us uh, about that. Well, actually what happened was uh, the mechanic advised that the plane would be ready Saturday, I think it was. That's the 23rd of July. And so I um, went up there. My wife, we live over in the Santa Cruz area, we drove up there. And she was going to pick me up where we'd keep our plane hangar down at Marina Airport. And the mechanic met us out there. He had, had the plane all washed and scrubbed and what have you. They had it for several weeks, putting in the rudder pedals, and there had been some problems. The original um, linkage had been apparently the wrong size. And when I was up there the week before, I noticed that I was sitting behind the controls and some of them felt like they were snagging a little bit. So I'm up there and pre-flighting the airplane mechanics there, and the uh, plane looks absolutely beautiful. And he had uh, lubricated all of the controls and cables and what have you. And went through, walked around the pre-flight, what have you. And I, you know, I'm thinking when I was a week before when I was playing with the elevators, it seemed a little snaggy. So I, my mind is thinking, I wonder, you know, if all the linkage to the rudders are okay. So I'm really concentrating on making sure the rudder and the elevator or stabilator, I guess is what we should be calling it, was was, was functional. Did a complete pre-flight and what have you. And uh, waved the mechanic off and started taxiing for takeoff on runway three one right. And uh, everything seemed absolutely beautiful. The controls were nice and smooth. I checked them for movement, full travel, and and uh, any conflict in the travel and stuff like that. What I didn't do, and I guess we'll be talking about that in a moment, is to make sure the continuity was correct. So anyway, I took off and the plane roll straight down the line. It was fabulous. Uh, you know, my concentrating on the on the rudders and thinking this thing is really just now perfect. Started to bring the nose up to lift off and all of a sudden it started an on commanded left turn. And I corrected and couldn't stop it. So uh, immediately pulled all the power controls back, everything all in one grab. The plane rolled off to the left, hit the uh, segmented circle, spun around, tore the gear, the nose gear off, and pretty much uh, wrecked the airplane completely. I was pretty fortunate. I got out with just a few minor cuts and bruises. Boy, I'll say you were very lucky. I've heard of other accidents like this in the past where the ailerons were connected incorrectly, where, where people actually died. So what was the, the thing, do you think, if you look back in all your training that saved you in this particular situation? Well, two things. One I'm embarrassed about, and the other one I talked to my former flight instructor and faculty member, Jerry Shree, who was my first flight instructor, and he uh, he made it clear two things. Keep your hand on the throttle during takeoff and landings, and when you're checking the control, make sure they're moving in the correct direction as well as moving smoothly. So I forgot the second part, and... Uh, but remember the first part, and that probably saved my life, as you probably know. Most of these, you get up in the air, and uh, and then it starts to roll. And uh, by the time you figure out what's what's happened, you're upside down and on the ground. Anyway, that's that's kind of <laughs> what happened. Now I'm thinking I'm rolling down the runway, and this thing starts to go left on me, and I'm thinking, oh, must have been something wrong with the rudder. It's just kicked in, and. Uh, uh, was there a, an issue with the autopilot? Did it somehow click on? But, you know, moving the controls uh, in full motion and quickly should have disconnected any any autopilot. Just couldn't figure out what happened. I, I, people asked me at the scene what happened. I said it was an on-commander and uh, uh, roll to the left. And it wasn't until I got a call from the mechanic who had come back and taken a look at the airplane and and said uh, the aileron controls had been uh, hooked up in reverse. And he said he wanted to be the first to tell me. And uh, the mechanics are probably one of the, the best mechanics I've ever come across. And I felt so bad for him that, you know, that this should be anything on his record. And uh, we've been looking at the chain, the causal link 
the number of things that had to happen for this for this accident to eventually occur. And it reminds me of what I you know, used to teach in aviation safety and security class at San Jose State. And there was Professor uh, Reason's Swiss cheese model, it basically taking a look at human analysis to try to determine, uh, you know, what what is it in the chain of events that could have been instituted to prevent the ultimate which was the accident. And so the Swiss cheese model is really quite a a guide to take a look at an accident after the fact to see what could have been done differently. And like Swiss cheese, if you get all the slices where the holes line up, which are the errors, uh, eventually uh, it leads to an accident of some sort. And the idea with the Swiss cheese model is if you can put a barrier any anywhere in between those slices of Swiss cheese so the holes don't line up, you've now prevented the ultimate, which is the accident. So what do you think all the different uh, individual errors were that occurred in, in this combination? Well, going back, you know, this is a 50-year-old airplane. And Murphy's Law. If it's possible to hook up the aileron cables in reverse, uh, Murphy says it's going to happen eventually. And uh, so what do you do if you're a manufacturer and uh, you take a look and see how can we manufacture this airplane so that that does not happen? Do we color code the connections so that green matches green and red matches red? Or do we offset them? You know, and let the engineers work it out. So that's probably the first slice in the Swiss cheese. Then you get down to the the shop level and the mechanics. Do they detect it? And uh, there's a mechanic who's actually doing the work and the supervisor who's then eventually inspecting the work. Have they uh, been adequately uh, trained and supervised and to catch that error? And then finally, you know, I, I take I take a major amount of responsibility for this is one of the first things I learned was to make sure the controls move in the correct direction. And if I had been thinking not rudder, but ailerons, and I had no reason to think that the ailerons had been disconnected, but if I had been thinking ailerons, I would have obviously been a little bit more suspect and checked for continuity. And I didn't. And so uh, I'm the last slice in the Swiss cheese model. And if I had done my job, uh, we wouldn't have had the accident. Yeah, that's a that's a good description. I think that this is one of those kinds of accidents that you know is extremely low probability of happening, and so unfortunately, you know, people are usually taught to check that you know when you turn the the stick or the yoke to the right that the right aileron goes up and vice versa. But if you've done that a thousand times, it's easy to kind of dismiss the possibility of it ever being uh, connected incorrectly. But even though this is a, you know, a low probability situation, it's a very high consequence. Uh, and so I think that those are probably one of the worst kinds of uh, accidents. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you take a look at uh, the feasibility or probability of occurring, but then what is the outcome? What is the the danger and the risk level? And uh, it's, you know, catastrophic. Uh, I was talking to a doctor friend of mine who retired from the Navy uh, as a flight surgeon and uh, flies MIGs now out of, uh, out of uh, Jackson Hole. And he was telling me a story about uh, an SR-71 Blackbird pilot, and apparently they have electronic uh, control connections that were set up in reverse. And uh, this pilot uh, said, I almost had it figured out, you know, how to control the airplane <laughs> when it went on controllable and you bailed, you know, ejected yeah. But, uh, others aren't so so fortunate. You know, I've always liked Bob Hoover and his advice about flying the airplane as far into the crash as possible. And uh, you know, somewhere in the back of my mind, I think that uh, I, I heeded that advice. Now, now I saw a very brief video from uh, the security camera at Reed Hillview, and could capture just kind of the last uh, maybe five, six seconds of the uh, the incident. It didn't look like you got up very high. How high off the ground do you think you were at the time? You know, what was the highest you got off the ground? A lot higher than I wanted to be. Hmm. 
<laughs> I don't know. I probably know more than about five feet because as soon as I realized there wasn't anything I was going to be able to uh, figure out, to do, I just chopped the power and uh, kept it as close to the ground as possible. Came pretty close to taking out the uh, the uh, metal stand for the windsock, which would have sliced the airplane in half. Mm. But, uh, yeah. It, uh, yeah, the, the yeah. video looked like you kind of rotated around the nose uh, <laughs> as it continued to turn after it struck the, the ground. But thank goodness it didn't go inverted or, or anything like that. Well, what, what made it tough is that, uh, well, I didn't know. My wife had been waiting alongside uh, one of the hangars there watching the takeoff, and she saw the whole thing. And so <laughs> when I finally got out of the airplane, I go, oh, my God, I'm alive, right? And I looked across, and there she was, and she was just dumbstruck. And, uh, and so I think I did a runway incursion uh, by walking across over to her, across 3-1 three one, uh, uh, three one right, because I ended up on 3-1 left. And uh, just to tell her, hey, you know, it's okay. Yep. Well, I'm sure the tower uh, understands. What uh, I mean, this really shows how uh, accidents that occur close to the ground have less energy and are much more survival than accidents that uh, you know occur when an aircraft goes out of control when it's much higher from the ground. What kind of lessons did you learn, and would you uh, advise people integrate into their flying practices? Two things. One, you know, here's an airplane that I've owned for ten years, and basically the only person that flies it. So you get lulled into a false sense of security. You know the systems, you know how just about everything about the airplane. And then you assume that everything is the same way that you left it. Uh, you're leaving yourself open for some uh, disappointment. And that's even more so if you're a rental pilot or you're in a, a club of some sort, uh, joint use of the airplane. It's tough because you don't want to say that the last guy that flew it was a... Uh, uh, flew it incorrectly or maybe damaged it, but you never know. And so I always taught my students, when you pre-flight an airplane, you don't pre-flight it as a thing that you do before you go flying. You actually do this to find a reason not to go flying. Hmm. And if you take that attitude to it, uh, you know, you're going to, you're going to live to be a Wright Brothers master pilot awardee or something to that uh, extent. Uh, but, uh, you know, especially with the clubs and rental aircraft, you never know if the last person or the, before them did something that they're kind of embarrassed about or don't want to get charged for or something like that. And so always pre-flight that airplane with the attitude, I'm going to find something today to keep me from flying. Hmm. And uh, that's probably a good mindset to have. You'll then be pleasantly surprised if you actually get to go flying. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. <laughs> well, now that the arrow is is gone, tell us uh, what you're flying now. Well, you and I met, and I want to thank you again, Max, for uh, attending my retirement and uh, award presentation. Uh, I think that was on August 3rd. And immediately after that, my wife and I got on to a, basically it turned out to be a red eye. Uh, on Southwest Airlines to Kansas City, where we uh, purchased a Bonanza, uh, the V-tail version. Uh, we really upgraded. We went from a 1968 uh, Piper to a 1970 Bonanza, but <laughs> it had all the bells and whistles on the radios and what have you. And it looked like it had pretty good maintenance on it. So uh, we're happy we flew it out uh, over the next two days. Well, I'm glad you're back in the air now, but you know, let's just talk a little bit about San Jose State University. I'm sure we may have some listeners that are thinking about getting a four-year college degree and are also interested in a career in aviation. Just take a couple of minutes and tell us about the aviation program there. Well, it's a fantastic program. The energy level on the faculty is fantastic. We have basically four different programs. Some students may have gotten a, an AMP certificate at a two-year college. And they can take their A to A degree and come into San Jose State on a two plus program and get a, uh, a management degree in maintenance management. And so, at some point when they're going to business for themselves, they'll they'll have the training and education to do that. 
We also have two types of programs for those who want to be airline or corporate pilots. One involves actually getting credit for flight training, which took me almost all of the 40 years I was there to get through uh, through the university system to get approval. We're the only CSU in the state that has the flight training program, the only one that has an aviation program. And, uh, you know, the costs are relatively low compared to some of the uh, other universities, out-of-state universities or or the uh, uh, Embry-Riddle, uh, which is a, basically a for-profit university. But the two options are you can go through and get all of the ground training and come up with a four-year BS degree in operations, but you do the flying on your own. Or you can go through our approved program, and if you get your commercial instrument through one of our affiliated uh, flight training uh, schools, you'll get the benefit of the uh, restricted airline transport pilot rating uh, certificate, excuse me, which means instead of having 1,500 hours required for that certificate, you can get through in as little as 1,000 hours. And that could be quite a savings, especially if you're paying for it yourself. Uh, That would probably be $70,000, $80,000 in savings. So uh, that program is pending FAA approval and uh, in place, and we have students going through the the commercial and instrument portion of their training through uh, affiliated Part 141 schools. And lastly, we have a a management program for people that want to be airport managers or operators. And that program uh, has been doing well. And we have a lot of of our graduates running airports and working for different airlines in their their corporate offices. And if people want to find out more about the aviation program, it looks to me like they can go to sjsu for San Jose State University dot edu slash Avtech, A-V-T-E-C-H. Is that the best place to go? Yeah, that is the best place to go. And uh, talk to our chair, Fred Barretts, and they'll tell you all about the program. We have, for the last 17 years, 18 years, been combined with the, the technology department. So uh, Avtech, that's aviation and technology. Some people uh, even go ahead and get uh, dual majors or get a minor in aviation or a minor in technology. No question. San Jose State has a great aviation program. Glenn, I'm wondering, do you have any other advice or thoughts about flying that you'd like to share with our listeners? I've always uh, been of the belief that the more eyes you put on an airplane, the, the better off you are. And what I mean by that is that I have nothing but high respect for all of the uh, maintenance people at uh, Reed Hillview. Uh, they're top-notch. Many of them have been faculty at San Jose State at one time or another when we had the uh, AMP program going. But what I would do over the years, the 10 years I had the Arrow, is uh, let the shop, one shop do the annual one year, another shop do the annual the next, and just kind of keep rotating it. It wasn't so much a matter of how much it cost, but again, just getting different uh, viewpoints on the airplane and uh, it's need for maintenance. I think that's good advice for anybody uh, to, uh, every once in a while, uh, even though you have a good relationship with your own shop, take it to another and and let them have a a chance to uh, see if they see something that no one else has. Glenn, I want to thank you so much for sharing your experience with our listeners. Hopefully they will profit from this and uh, this will improve their safety in the future. Thanks so much for sharing all the details. You're welcome, Max. Nice to talk to you. Great talking with you, too. By the way, here's what I teach my students from day one. When you're checking the controls during the run-up, just grab a hold of the yoke or stick and stick your thumb straight up. Then when you move the yoke or the stick, your thumb will point at the aileron that is supposed to be up. If you do that religiously, just make sure when you go to the right, the right aileron is up. And when you go to the left, the left aileron is up. If you do that religiously, every time you do your run-up, you'll avoid ever taking off with the controls connected backwards. And by the way, this is a mistake that even test pilots make. In 2006, I remember when the sole prototype of the Spectrum 33, now that was a $3.6 million business jet, 
it crashed on takeoff, killing both the pilots. Now, witnesses reported that the plane entered a right roll and immediately cartwheeled when the right wing hit the ground. And according to the NTSB, the ailerons were linked in a manner that reversed roll control such that left roll input from the stick deflected the ailerons to produce right roll of the aircraft and vice versa. By the way, prior to the accident, the aircraft had undergone extensive maintenance, including removal of the main landing gear, and that required disconnecting a portion of the aileron control system linkage. Well, this is our last show of the month, and that's the one where I mention everyone who's contributed on Patreon at the $20 a month level or higher. And speaking of Patreon, this week I'm going to be posting news stories there since I'm doing a little bit of travel, and that's going to be an easier place for me to share those with you. And I'll include some stories about Hurricane Harvey in Texas and other general aviation stories. Now, anyone can read these. Just go to a web browser, type in aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And while you're there, you can, if you like, make a contribution toward the show as little as $2 a month, and that cost will be billed to your credit card each month. So let me mention our $20 level and up contributors. They are Jeremy Zawadny. He's a software developer. Peter Long, who's a pilot in Australia. Seth Lake, military instructor pilot and flight instructor in Arkansas. And Jason Blair, who's a DPE, that's a pilot examiner. And he runs a blog at jasonblair.net. He also is getting married in 10 days. So congratulations to you and your wife, Jason. And don't forget, if you're thinking of buying a new or slightly used Cirrus, please contact me early in the process so I can help you with that decision. I specialize in the Cirrus and work with people around the country. If you love the show, please show your friends how to find this podcast on their smartphone. And until next week, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. <laughs>